Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. If you enjoy listening to scary stories, this is the place to be. I upload every single day. Please subscribe and leave a like on today's video before we begin. I never thought I'd be writing about a date quite like this. Sometimes, things take such an unexpected turn that you can't help but feel like you're a lead character in an awkward coming-of-age film. You know the kind, where the protagonist tries to juggle romance, self-discovery, and absurdity. Today was one of those days Riley, that was her name, I swiped right on her profile on Tinder roughly three weeks ago. She was a nice cute girl, had a vibrant energy about her, and she seemed to be the typical girl that I would usually date, i.e. my type. At first she intrigued me, and we started a conversation, talking about where we went to school, and also things that didn't really make any sense like funny jokes. Our conversations flowed easily until eventually I gave her my Instagram and we started DMing each other on that app. Our messages were getting longer as we sent jokes and memes back and forth, sharing encounters, favourite songs and memories of our past. I learned that she was 19, a college student studying for a semester I told her about my passion for photography and how I loved incorporating creative visuals into my projects. I had only just come out of college, the same one that she was currently at, so not only did I think she was cute, but we had a lot in common. We seemed to mesh quite well, well that's what I thought, but it was early days. She suggested a really weird type of first date ice skating. This was a recipe for embarrassment and disaster, and it felt like the perfect mix of fun, but also Christmas nostalgia. It was December, I'm not really a huge Christmas guy. I miss my mum, she was the best at making Christmas fun. I don't want to go into that, as that's something for a different story, probably one I won't ever share with the public. Who doesn't have fond memories of slipping around on the ice, going round on those silly penguin guy things, laughing, holding on to each other for support? I was excited but also kind of knew that I was going to embarrass myself. And having said that, I'm pretty sure ice rinks can be dangerous, so I knew that I was going to have to be very careful, otherwise I'd end up falling on my back or my neck. The day came for our date at the ice rink, we were due to meet in the evening. It was cold, the winter chill was nipping at my face and making my lips numb, but I welcomed it. It was a festive season and I liked hot chocolate, roasted chestnuts and a bunch of other Christmassy things that you can't really have in the heat of summer. I walked into the rink and I started looking around. I could see her standing near the entrance on the other side. The ice rink has two entrances. It's extremely busy and usually full of families at this time of the year. Sure enough it was, but that's not necessarily what put me off. As if I was only in there with her, just us two alone, I'd still probably fall over and embarrass myself. She spotted me and her face lit up in the most disarming way. Hey! She shouted from across the rink, throwing her arms around me in an energetic hug. It was a bit OTT. She was a bit crazy, if I can call her that. I felt a bit unconscious, unconscious about what I was doing there. She took control of everything, and it felt kind of weird. She reminded me almost like my mum, and I didn't like that. Hey Riley, I replied ready to make a fool of ourselves. Ha! <laughs> oh, I intend to, she laughed. 
We rented our skates and clumsily made our way to the ice, praying that we wouldn't fall over and break a leg. So, the first couple of laps around the rink were good. Talking with her was relaxed, chilled out, and I didn't manage to fall over or break any ligaments. I held onto the metal railing for most of the time, I was treating it like a lifeline, as it was genuinely hard to struggle for balance on these weird thin skates. Riley, however, had clearly been before, hence why she came up with the idea to have the date here. She was skating around with ease, trying to show off, and I'll be honest, I couldn't help but admire her. She was cute, fit, and knew what she was doing. She took a few steps away, daring me to let go of the railing. I held my breath and tried to imitate her moves. Just let it flow, she encouraged me. She had a bright grin all over her face, just staring at me, as if she was somehow my teacher. As I miraculously managed to skate without falling, my confidence began to build and I felt more relaxed and at ease in the rink, even if it was extremely busy, with a bunch of kids who looked about two foot tall. I found myself scanning the rink, admiring the twinkling lights overhead, and the fun atmosphere. We skated side by side slowly for a while, while holding hands, pushing playfully at each other to joke around. Then she came up with an idea of playing it. I chase her, and she has to get away. We soon realised this game was totally stupid, as I can still barely skate, and she can do it easily, no problem. About an hour, we took a break and warmed our hands around steaming cups of hot chocolate. I started teasing her about her fallen attempts to skate backwards, but who was I to comment? I could barely skate forwards. Come on, I thought you were an adventurous girl, I said, sipping my drink. Shush, it was just gravity, right? Scientific, you wouldn't understand. As the night went on, things started to go so well that I actually enjoyed my time with this girl. We shared more about ourselves, and I learned about her quirky family and her odd obsession with collecting postcards. In turn, I shared my memories of my childhood, and suddenly everything felt a bit intimate. Too soon, too fast? Too fast, too soon. Which way is it? But then... Something began to confuse me about Riley. We continued to talk, and the way she was looking at me was very weird. It was almost a seductive look, as if she was like, Hey, let's go have fun. I don't know how else I'm supposed to describe this. It felt oddly intense, and a little more than what I would be comfortable with. You know, this is great, she said. I really like you. I could totally see us moving in together, like, after a few more dates or something, you know. My heart froze, and I wondered what the hell this girl was on about. We'd only met and been together for half an hour, and she was talking about moving in? Now this is a red flag, but at the time my stupid ass didn't register that, and I just found it weird, not a warning sign, like I should have taken it as. We'd known each other for such a short time. Moving in together seemed like a leap off a cliff that I wasn't prepared for. I forced a smile, but it felt strained. Wow, Riley, I said carefully. That's a bit forward, don't you think? We've only just met. I know, I know, but I just feel good around you. You get me like no one else. I suppose I should have seen the warning signs then and I'd seen glimpses of this obsessiveness in her messages, the way she wanted immediate replies, and if I didn't give them, she'd start blowing up my phone or spam calling me. Oh, and the way she nearly swamped my notifications, so I couldn't even differentiate my friend's messages from hers. In that moment, I just tried to forget about it, trying to enjoy the rest of the night, and think that she was maybe just joking, or perhaps serious, but not to do it in another few months, at the earliest. Let's just enjoy the night, I suggested, trying to avoid the conversation that we were currently having, 
and to take us back to a lighter note, but she nodded with a dreamy smile on her face. After several more laps around the rink and a few knowable moments of awkwardness, it was finally time to say goodbye. I felt bad that I had to crush her spirits, as I could tell Riley changed after I said no, as if she was expecting me to just bring her home and set up a bed below mine. I knew I couldn't lead her on. What was I supposed to say? Oh yes, you can move in tomorrow. I can't wait. Open brackets. Would guys actually say that? I can't believe it. Close brackets. Underneath all that charm was a fear, a fear that lingered like a cloud. Quote, Hey Riley, I had a really nice time tonight, I said. She looked at me, biting her lips, as if to try and seduce me more. But, her smile dimmed slightly and I took a deep breath. I think it's best if we don't see each other again. You're great, but I'm not ready for something that serious. I hope you understand. I don't want anyone moving in with me. The moment fell into an utterly awkward silence. Her expression had changed from confusion to hurt. Wait, what? Did I do something wrong? No, no, you didn't do anything wrong, I said, feeling awkward. How else can I put it? It's just, I don't think we're on the same page right now. Okay, this was fun. I'm here to date, but... I'm not looking for a wife just yet, or a housemate. She nodded slowly as I said these words, and she just looked like a possessive, crazy woman at this point. She looked pissed off, and I wasn't really sure what to say next. Okay, if that's what you want, she replied, annoyed. Her shoulders were sagging, as though she had just felt like she wasted her whole night, even coming to see me. That was a weird vibe, because it gave off the energy that the only reason she came was to get something out of me, for example, staying at my house. I really did have fun tonight, Riley, I said, but she seemed completely out of it, staring off into the distance, lost in thought, as if she was contemplating where she was going to sleep that night. All right, see you around, she said as she turned around and walked off. I felt like crap after that date. I'll be honest, I thought I was a bit rude to her. But again, I wasn't going to say to her, sure, come live with me, I'll take you in like a pet dog. I walked home that night. It was really cold, minus five degrees. When I got home, I went through my evening routine, trying to put the night out of my mind. The lights in my apartment were warm and welcoming as I came in from the cold temperatures. I poured myself a glass of milk and decided that I was going to pour it in a pan and heat it up. I wanted to forget about what happened and how bad I made Riley feel and in turn made myself feel. But just as I sat down on my couch, there was a weird noise outside my window. I didn't understand what this noise was, but my brain tried to register it as a stray cat. Maybe the wind or something knocking, but I wouldn't think that it was a human. Then I heard it again. It was a soft knock on my door. I was confused. I'd only had the briefest of encounters with Riley. Why was she at my house? Yeah, I turned my head, look out the window. And there's a girl wearing the exact same clothing, the exact same hat and gloves as Riley. Sure enough, as I walk over and get closer to the figure, I notice it's her. I can see her facial features clearly, and I can make out that she's come to my house. I was trying to figure out how she made it to my house. She must have had to follow me, as I never told her where I lived, unless she's some kind of an expert hacker. Instinctively, I grabbed my phone, not to call the police, but to send a quick message to my friend Max. I thought maybe he could help me, come over and just get rid of this girl, who clearly was trying to somehow couch surf at my place. Sure enough, as I open up the door, she tries to barge her way in while mid-conversation explaining. Yeah, I was supposed to just block her? 
Well, I'm not the one to assault. So, she just walked straight on in. She didn't have any bags, nothing, not even a purse or a handbag. She sat down on my couch and said, Can we watch TV? I want to watch TV. The way she said that was like a spoiled brat. I turned around and told her she needed to get the hell out of my house, or I was going to call the police. But deep down in my mind, I didn't want to call the police. Because then that would create a nightmare. A nightmare where a case would be opened, a report would be filed, and I could have to spend hours on end at a police department, just being questioned. Riley was the type of girl to make up false accusations, and guys, you never ever want to go near one of those. She gave me the vibes that she's been chewed up and spat out by some guy that abused her, and now she's just trying to go around hopping from guy to guy for a way to somehow afford food and rent. It was scary, and when Max finally came round, we convinced her to leave, otherwise we would call the police. Even though I don't think we would have if she didn't leave, we probably would have tried to just physically remove her, and I know that's probably not the best option, but I'm pretty sure I had the right to. We never heard from her again, thank god, and of course she blocked me on everything, which at first I was kind of surprised about, but thinking back now it was expected, as she just wanted to use me, and the whole date was an act, and a large facade. It's funny how life throws you in the deep end sometimes, huh? One minute you're chilling on a Friday night at a guy you met on Tinder's house. The next minute there's a car plowing through the front wall, sending chairs, and most importantly Harry's cat, flying through the air like it's a scene from some insane action film. It's now been a few hours since this happened, and I still can't quite process it. I'm sitting here on the floor of Harry's living room. Yep, my laptop is on my lap, and the police and the ambulance workers, oh, plus the fire department, are all still outside. I always watch and listen to these types of stories, but I never had anything to contribute. Well, now I do, and I almost died for it. It was a normal evening. I remember everything pretty clearly. I had been dating Harry for three months now. We were getting into a rhythm that felt nice. He was 22, nice hair, those warm expressive brown eyes, and a nice personality. He's from Oregon, an outdoorsy guy who shared his love for just being a goofball. How else do I put it? I came over to Harry's place just past 7pm. I took off my shoes at the front door, the way he had shown me before, so I don't mess up his brand new carpet. His house was around 3 or 4 bedrooms. His house, yeah. His dad helped him with the deposit. But Harry works damn hard, so I won't take it away from him. The place was full of overstuffed couches, stacks of random weird posters, and plasters all over of indie bands. I could hear him laughing, a couple of his friends around in the living room. He'd invited a few of them over for a game night. He'd promised me that we would play Catan together. The moment I walked in, I was welcomed with hugs and high fives from his friends, which was super cute. It was a usual crowd of two guys, Mike and Jesse and two girls, Tara and Kim. We spent the first hour joking around, snacking on a ridiculous amount of chips and salsa, while sipping on sparkling water. Open brackets. Harry was trying to stay fit after last weekend's pizza binge. I sat on the couch with him, taking in the moment, feeling like a part of the group as we all laughed back and forth over the game. Okay, okay, I get it. 
What's this got to do with what happened? Well, I love socializing because I'm a lonely person. In fact, I'm awful at making friends, and the only way I've made any was through Harry. If I hadn't have met Harry three months ago, I'd still be a complete recluse, staying in my parents' bedroom. No, wait, not my parents' bedroom, my own bedroom. It was refreshing. We're on the cusp of something fun, something, well, dangerous. We set up the board for Catan. I leaned into Harry, whispered some playful jabs about him being the loser. He laughed and tossed his hair back. This was the Harry I was getting to know, funny, relaxed, and kind. He liked teasing me, which I found super sweet, and also a turn on. The laughter bounced around the room as the drinks flowed and people were enjoying themselves. Suddenly, just as we were about to roll the dice, we heard a weird fizzling sound. It cut through our laughter and made us all stop talking, and there was a brief second pause. A moment later, and I mean a moment being a quarter of a second, the loudest sound I have ever heard in my life roared through inches past me. I heard everything before I saw it, which is weird because usually for people in traumatic accidents, it's the other way around. They lose their sense of hearing, but they can see. I didn't really have a chance to comprehend what I was looking at, but I was still looking at it. It's just I wasn't processing it. The only way to describe this is when someone makes you jump. They jump scare you by leaping out from behind a door, and in the seconds that you're looking at them before you react, jump or run away or slip, that is what I call seeing it, but not comprehending it. The car that came through his window was something I watched, but could not comprehend. There was this huge crashing sound after the car had travelled halfway into his living room. Once the sounds came through and my brain started to function again, I was flooded with some kind of numbing adrenaline. This wasn't the normal type of adrenaline I've ever felt, and I've heard people comment below saying that it's noradrenaline, some kind of weird substance that's rare and is only injected when you think you're going to die. Well, I sure as hell thought I was going to die. The second thing I experienced was extreme anxiety for all of the other people in this living room. Harry, his friends, and his cat, who I specifically saw go flying at the point of impact. From what I could see, the cat seemed to be the only person hurt. The chaos after was more than chaos. There truly is no word that can actually describe what it was like. A full-blown car had come crashing through the living room. There was wood, glass, and debris everywhere. There was no time to process how it happened, or where it had come from. Harry's friends were on the floor, his cat had been thrown into the kitchen by the sheer force, and Mike had been knocked to the ground. I didn't have so much as a single mark on me, which was a miracle, considering I had smashed glass all over my legs, and a couple of weird bits of metal that seemed to have skimmed off from a part of the car. The sight was surreal. The car was a battered and mangled sedan that had been crushed while it came through the wall like a bulldozer on a mission. There were clouds of dust. The electrics were sparking. Everything had just frozen. Time slowed in that moment as reality twisted around me. I caught a glimpse of Harry's cat. It was getting back up and limping. It was still alive, but we didn't know how bad the injuries were. That damn thing was hurled through the air like a fuzzy cannonball. He soared at least 20 feet into the room across. I instinctively gasped, where was my phone? Would I be first to dial 911? Who was in the car? How did it happen? Are they still alive? 
If I was to list off all the questions I experienced in those seconds, would have a story of just bullet point questions in and of themselves. I had to document this insanity. I had to remember this night. But everything was a mess. It still is. The dust began to settle and the sounds and the visuals from the crash died down. My racing mind slowly started to silence. Harry, where was he, was my next thought. I instinctively turned my eyes towards him, and I was relieved to see him standing. He looked dizzy and dazed, just a few feet away from the wreck. He seemed to recover quickly. His instincts kicked in as he started to walk towards his friends. Mike, who was on the floor, Jesse, who was laying half up the wall. It was awful, but there was no blood, nothing, from us. The driver died. We didn't even go in and look. In fact, it didn't even cross our minds that there was a driver. That sounds stupid as hell, I know. But we were so caught up in the safety of our own lives. Combined with the fact that the driver had fallen into the footwell and his body had basically been split up by part of the glass, we didn't realise. Jesse was the one to find the driver after he looked in. Then, when the fire department arrived, they cut him out, cleared some room to pull the car out, and the ambulance tried to revive him. It was for no luck, though. The guy was gone for at least five or ten minutes. Bringing him back would just cause him a life of brain damage and disability. We started to shout our friends. We grouped together and hugged each other. The girls were crying, including myself. I jumped to my feet to help and to see what had happened. My heart was racing and the noradrenaline was pumping. I could see Mike laying on the floor. He was holding his side and Jesse was moaning as if he had been seriously hurt. Are you guys okay? I faced them half yelling. Everything was chaos. People were starting to come out of shock. Tara rushed to Mike while Kim checked on Jesse. Thankfully, both of them seemed to be mostly okay, just a bit shaken and bruised, but I could tell they were in pain. What the hell just happened? Mike said, turning to Harry with an incredulous expression. I have no idea, Harry shouted back, slightly in disbelief. He looked over to me. He looked terrified. Are you okay? He said. I nodded looking back at the car, which was in pieces. My eyes soon darted back to his cat, old sweet heavens, approximately where I last saw him in mid-flight, was twenty meters away off into the kitchen. I raced over to the spot where he had been limping around. I felt my heart drop when I realized the spot was empty. Where had his cat gone? Harry called him in a high-pitched tone. Finally, his cat came running over. I found it cute that he was still alive, but he was in a bad state. He was limping and was trying to get out of the house to get away from the wreckage, even though he badly needed our help. From somewhere underneath the debris, we started to hear noises. These noises were of a random squirrel that got caught up in all of the calamity. I know, weird unexpected. We followed the sounds and freed it, and eventually started to look at the car. That's when Jesse and Tara found the guy. He smelt bad. You could barely make out he was a human. His body was sliced up, and the neighbours began to start knocking on Harry's door, as if there was any point. The window and the living room wall was busted open. At that moment, my adrenaline started to subside. I became extremely exhausted, as if I couldn't keep my eyes open. It was like the injection of adrenaline had absolutely paralysed me. It had sedated me. I had gone from being heightened alert to almost sleepy, unable to stay awake. The rest of this evening has been a blur. I can't see properly, there's ringing in my ears my hands are shaking almost too much to even type this out. 
I think I'm gonna go help them. I feel guilty for just hiding away here. I need to go out. I feel traumatized after seeing that guy's body being pulled out of the sedan. That was a bad sight. It was gruesome. Wow. What a night. Okay. It's going to take a lot to make sense of this all. This is definitely going to be one for the books. I'd been talking to a guy named Matt for the past couple of weeks. We clicked almost instantly over messaging. After a few days of unconventional flirting, we decided to meet in person at a buffet cafe called All You Can Eat Paradise. It was a casual place, but I knew that people tend to get a little wild around endless food options. It seemed like a good idea for our first date, as we couldn't think of anything else, so we had to settle with it. I arrived 20 minutes early, typical me right, I want to make a great first impression. I decided that I was going to walk in and just take a seat, even if he wasn't there. I got into the cafe, I looked around, trying to figure out where the hell to sit. The place was full of families, couples, and groups of friends. All were just piling their plates. It was hilarious, and the food didn't even look that nice. I took a seat near the entrance, a good spot where I could see the door and spot Matt when he arrived. I settled in and I thought about all the possibilities, the cute jokes we'd laugh over, the embarrassing stories we'd share, and of course, how much were we actually going to eat. After a few minutes of fidgeting, I was on my phone while tapping the table. I noticed a guy enter the cafe. He looked similar to Matt, but I couldn't quite tell if it was him. I was wondering if his photos were outdated, and they were taken from three, four, or even seven or eight years ago. He had the same black hair, the similar smile, and was dressed how I'd expect him to be dressed. Blue t-shirt and jeans. He looked just like Matt. And in those moments, that's who I thought it was. This was my mental image of what he'd looked like. I'd seen photos of him, and unless this guy was his twin, it was definitely him. Feeling bold, I flagged him down, curious as to why he had kind of glanced at me, but just kept walking by. Maybe he didn't recognize me. I got up and chased him. Hey, are you Matt? Um, sorry, why? Uh, it's me. Ariana, I'm here to meet you for the date. The guy pauses for a few seconds. Ah, yeah, he replied. Wow, great to meet you in person, I said, standing up and extending my hand, which he accepted with a friendly shake. By the time we'd sat down and the waitress had come over and handed us our plates and asked for our drinks orders, I'd started to think, this guy doesn't sound like Matt. I'd been doing a couple of voice calls with Matt, and I got to know how his voice sounded, and this supposed Matt didn't quite sound like him. Although he did have the same southern accent, it wasn't exactly the same. I had my suspicions, wondering if maybe he had been putting on a voice, or was changing it intentionally. Who knows, people do some weird stuff because of date night nerves. We started piling our plates, I picked pizza alfredo, a bunch of garlic bread, and a ton of lasagna. I was definitely going to have a pretty bad few days of digestion issues, 
Considering I'm super bad at dealing with different types of allergens, I tried my hardest to just enjoy the food while also listening to what Matt had to say. By around the 30 minute mark, I noticed that this definitely wasn't Matt, but I was so stupid and so hungry that I just ignored the fact that I had ruined my own date and was probably going to also ruin another guy's life. Sure enough, the real Matt walks in around 25 minutes late for the date, seeing as I did get there pretty early. He looks over at me, I'm stuffing my face with garlic bread, I've got pizza sauce all over my cheeks, and after a few seconds, he looks at the guy opposite me, turns around, and just walks out of the restaurant. That was the moment that my soul dropped, and I felt so bad and guilty for supposedly what I had done. This guy in front of me wasn't the Matt I was dating. This was just a random guy who had pretended to be Matt to then try and reattain my number so that he could sleep with me. Yo, talk about low standards, but I fell for those. I feel gullible and I feel stupid. By the third plateful, my stomach was about to explode, and this guy wouldn't shut the hell up about how his dad has tons of money that he's going to inherit. It was so cringy. He was clearly trying to impress me and get me to somehow give him my number again for the supposed second time. He wasn't good at acting or convincing me that he was Matt either. He kept asking weird basic beginner questions like, what's your name? Where did you come from? Where are you living? Like, bro, I'm not an alien. What the hell is this all about? The guy was trying so hard to get a bit of pee that he actually tried to pretend to be someone else. It made me giggle, but it was also super bad because I felt guilty more than anything else. Why? Because I was supposed to be dating the guy that just turned around and left. God only knows what emotions he felt walking back to his car. He probably thought, oh, I was 25 minutes late. So she just picked any other guy in the restaurant to have a date with. Wow, what a nasty girl. Horrible. She must sleep around. This is what I thought, and I potentially considered the fact that this guy now hated me. I thought of trying to message him to try and explain myself. Why had I been talking to that other guy? Why was I there? Why was I still eating? But then I just realized... It wouldn't really matter what I say, because he just wouldn't believe me. Imagine it. Put yourself in my shoes. You come for a date with a guy, or a girl, and when you arrive, they're eating food and on a date with someone else. That's weird. It's creepy. And a whole bunch of other stuff compiled into one. What was I supposed to think and do? No one knows. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for staying tuned until the end of tonight's stories. If you enjoyed these stories and you want to help the channel, all you need to do is click the like button and comment a word of advice or interact with the stories down below by giving your opinions in the comment section. You can criticize the stories and comment what you think, give your opinions and how you would react in these situations. Also, if you're not subscribed to my channel, then please consider doing it, as I am the most regularly up- regularly- regular- <laughs> regularly- I'm the most regular uploading channel for the horror story niche on the whole of YouTube. There are no other horror story channels that upload 45 minute videos every single night, always brand new stories. The ones that do that are probably just re-uploading their own videos, which isn't good. Thank you, and I'll catch you tomorrow.